Right, I'm going to get started. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. I'm delighted to welcome you to Fair Fashion, a conversation on fashion, race and climate justice. Diolch am ymuno a ni heno, mae'n blesur ganeth eich crosawi i ffasiwn teg, sgrs am ffasiwn hil ac y fiawnder y hinsawdd, Aileen Burmeister dwi, penaeth Cymru Masnach Deg. I'm Aileen Burmeister, I'm the head of Fairtrade Wales and I'll be facilitating tonight's event, organised in partnership with the Sub-Sahara Advisory Panel. Tonight's event will be through the medium of English. Just to let everyone know, we are recording this event and that it will be going up on uh, Fairtrade Wales's YouTube channel in the next week or so, once we've got that sorted. And we will email all people who've signed up through Eventbrite as to it. So if you do have any technical difficulties, we hope that nobody does, um, but it will all be made available. We have a webinar format for tonight, which means that you should be able to see all of us as speakers, but you can't see or hear from each other as attendees. But you can interact on the chat box and I can see lots of you are already saying hello, which is lovely to see. Um, a note on code of conduct that any form of abusive or offensive language or behaviour in the chat boxes all throughout the session will not be tolerated. Please listen with respect and be mindful of the experience of others. We're here as part of Fairtrade Fortnight 2022, which is a chance to shine a spotlight on what the climate crisis means for the people around the world who produce the things we love to eat, drink and wear here in Wales. To give you some context, fashion makes headlines as one of the most unsustainable sectors and biggest contributors to climate change. It has huge emissions and waste that poisons the land, animals and people. The global textile industry is, is full of inequality and COVID-19 has highlighted this yet again with fast fashion brands refusing to pay for clothing that they'd already ordered. Workers, 80% of whom are women of colour in Asia and Africa, experienced huge losses. Many became unemployed and lost their livelihoods in the pandemic. Cotton is one of the most important fibre crops in the global textile industry. We'll be talking a bit about that tonight. And for almost 30 years, farmers and workers in the most climate vulnerable countries have been the fundamental reason fair trade exists. The climate crisis is now one of the biggest threats to the livelihoods of millions of small scale farmers and agricultural workers in low income countries worldwide, even though they have done the least to cause it. So tonight we're asking, can fashion ever be fair? Our brilliant panel are here to discuss the intersection of fashion, race, and climate justice. What I'm going to do first is ask each of the panels to panel members to introduce themselves and say a little bit about themselves, their work and their passions. So I'm going to ask Subindu first if you can introduce yourself. Hello, thank you for having me on this panel and uh, I would like to start by introducing myself and then I'll talk a little bit about fair trade and, and fashion in the areas uh, that we work in the challenges that exist. So I'm Subindu and I'm responsible for cotton and textiles at Fairtrade. I come from the fashion supply chains. I worked in and lived in three countries uh, working in different roles. And at Fairtrade, I'm responsible uh, for working with businesses, uh, with producer organizations and coordinating with, uh, with the Fairtrade uh, system colleagues as well. Uh, so Fairtrade is a grassroots global movement, as most of you might know, with the goal to make trade fair. It is an empowerment model uh, which aims and support, supports farmers and workers to secure um, sustainable livelihoods. And there are many tools that Fairtrade uses um, in supporting the farmers and workers, right from Fairtrade standards um, to Fairtrade minimum price, which is a safety net for the cotton farmers, like with other commodities, um, so that uh, they are protected if, if the global prices of the commodity um, changes. Uh, there is the fair trade premium, which is an additional amount that goes to the farmers uh, producer organization and they themselves decide how they can use it. Um, fair trade provides various trainings, uh, supports on projects on the ground and also helps with advocacy and building up um, commercial relationships for the cotton farmers. The fashion sector, as some of you might know, is formed of really long and complex supply chains. 
And there are many hands who touch the garment before it reaches us or the end, end consumer. Um, the sector is, it is actually a race to the bottom and is full of uh, issues, some of which Eileen has already mentioned, you know, right from poverty wages for factory workers to, you know, really low incomes for cotton farmers that they're not able to support their family for basic needs like education uh, or even food security. And that is because they're forced to sell their cotton at world prices, which means sometimes they're not even able to recover their own cost of uh, inputs and, and production. Um, we also see that there is a lot of forced labor and we have seen some recent examples of the worst forms of forced labor in detention camps in China. Um, there is overuse of chemicals and pesticides. Uh, the soils are depleted and the water is polluted. So we might not always see it, but someone somewhere is paying the price for the cheap fashion that we all consume or is very easily available, be it a small farmer, a factory worker, or mother nature, you know, all of it, these are the external costs that come with it. Uh, Eileen touched on COVID and, you know, so we, the whole world experienced it, but the realities were different. And you've already mentioned how brands canceled the orders, uh, even for the shipments which were ready. And this ran into billions, which meant that some of the factory workers were, had, were to be laid off. And this is the only source of income uh, for them. And we should also remember that uh, usually in countries where our clothes are produced, there is no social security or furlough schemes uh, for, for the factory workers. We see the same imbalance when we look at climate change. So there is this unpredictability of uh, weather conditions, which for us in Europe might just be a matter of inconvenience, a bit of rain and storm, but for the cotton farmers, it is actually a reality which plays out on a daily basis, which might have an impact like loss of full crop of cotton if the rain is delayed or, and or loss of, loss of income. So, I think it is important to understand that all these issues are interconnected uh, and these are systemic because they are interconnected issues, whether we talk about poverty, child labor, um, power imbalance, trade policies, human and environmental rights, climate change, these are all interconnected and it needs action at all levels in order to be able to address them. I'll leave it here for now and uh, shall come in later uh, with more thoughts. Thank you, Sabinda. That's a really interesting start. Um, Ophelia, could you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ophelia Dos Santos. I am a Welsh textile designer and climate justice activist. Um, I'm based in Cardiff. Um, and through my workshops and online platform, I inform and inspire conversations um, to do with sustainable fashion, um, overconsumption, um, and equality. Um, I'll leave it at that. It's going to be short because I have some pictures that I'd, I'd rather talk to you a little bit more about um, later on. Thanks, Ophelia. And Simone, if you could introduce yourself as well. Hi everyone, I'm Simone, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a campaigner and educator. I used to work on fossil-free divestment campaigns, so divestment is basically when you take your money out of something, out of a share, for example, um, and I did that with universities, and now like, I currently work with NUS on their Decolonize Education campaign, which centres um, Black people through a movement that is like networked, resourced and active. Um, I'm super passionate about climate justice, geography, history, joy, and many other things. Um, and like, I currently do sort of workshops with young people, particularly like young climate campaigners, about like what climate colonialism is, um, how climate colonialism influences like the environmental racism we see today, and also um, what we can do to campaign about it and like how we include like environmental racism in our climate justice narratives. Um, yeah, that's it. 
That's it. Fabulous. That's loads. <laughs> Thank you. So we're really excited to have everyone um, here and we've got some huge topics that we're only going to be, you know, um, dipping into because they're such big areas. So um, I'm going to go through a few questions now. I'm going to go to Ophelia first. Um, so statistics and evidence show us that fast fashion is a huge problem. How do we educate and inspire people to see the value in fashion and textiles? Um, that's a good question. So I think today we live in this very accelerated um, society. Everything is really fast. Um, and so we don't have a lot of, we don't place a lot of value on uh, our material possessions because, you know, overconsumption is is pretty much normalized and we're constantly like bombarded with advertisements and images of uh, lives that we that are supposed to be desirable that you should have uh, new things um, and new material goods you should look a certain way and um, to fit in and that doesn't um, you know, secondhand clothing, for example, doesn't normally fit into that that um, category. So through my work, I try to, um, you know, empower people to start thinking that old can be attractive and old can be desirable. Um, because, yeah, as a society, we think of old and we think of unattractive and we think of uh, to be avoided. Um, so yeah, with what I do, I really try to um, change that narrative and um, show that, you know, patchwork can be sexy. It's not all about, um, you know, pretty little things, really tight, um, you know, uh, body con dresses. Um, there's um, an image in fast fashion, particularly that only shows us um, a certain um image and it is you'd recognize it by you know the kardashians which is like um a white woman that looks a bit racially ambiguous or is mixed race and um or a white woman that you know cherry picks uh, those black features you know the the curvy figures or the big lips um and you'll see that plastered all over fast fashion sites in these really tiny little um uh body con dresses and yeah so what i do i try to um show that there's other um other parts of fashion that are uh, attractive and that can be um that can make you feel good and um, a lot of people uh, are still a bit afraid to kind of explore their own identity through fashion um because like I said, um, fashion perpetuates, or fast fashion particularly, perpetuates one image. Um, so, yeah, to step outside of that and explore um, what you really like is, is sometimes very difficult. Um, I think we all go through that age of, like, being in our teens and we just want to wear exactly what um, everyone else is wearing around you. I, I remember a stage where I was hanging out with my friends and wearing um, maybe, like tight jeans like skinny jeans and uh you know black and white converse you see a lot of teenage girls wearing um and even though that made made me feel like I could fit in that wasn't um necessarily what I enjoyed wearing so um yeah I'm very lucky to have found um my own identity through fashion and and I also encourage people to do that that was a bit long I, I don't know if I answered the question there <laughs> No, that's brilliant. That's really good things to point out. And I think how, how fashion impacts our identity uh, mm -hmm. and how we feel and how we look is actually really mm -hmm. um, important and something that, you know, women's fashion, particularly throughout the, the centuries, has sometimes been about controlling bodies and what they look like. So mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. able to, to find that is, is a really good point. Yeah, it's yeah. just one of the ways in which fashion um, kind of carries colonial values through its structures. Um, so I, I know we're going to um, touch on other um, kind of areas in which it does. Um, um, and what I talked about is kind of touching on um, appropriation, but there's, there's many ways. Thank you. That's great. Um, Sabindu, you talked a little bit earlier uh, about the, the industry. So can you tell us the current situation that specifically that cotton farmers are facing? with escalating climate problems and how fair trade is addressing the issues faced by producers? 
Yeah, so I did touch on some of the aspects uh, earlier as well. I'll just try and complement uh, what I have said. So, uh, you know, we, we were talking about imbalances. So here again, uh, the most vulnerable are impacted the most. Uh, they, till last year, the farmers were thinking whether they should continue farming cotton or not, because some of them actually um, farm cotton because there's nothing else that they can do. It might be because of the kind of land they are, they are in. Um, and, uh, and I've also touched on the unpredictability of whether, and you know, most of the farmers are actually rain-fed farmers. So this means they are really dependent on the whole cycle uh, of, of seasons. And if there is any delay, it could mean um, the loss of, loss of crop. So fair trade has been engaging uh, in addition to the tools of fair trade minimum price and premium and um, the ones that I've earlier mentioned earlier. We have also been engaging in um, things like um, academy for teaching about uh, climate ad adaptation and mitigation for farmers. This is not specific to cotton. It is in general that fair trade has these. Uh, we are uh, working on a curriculum on regenerative agriculture so that the soil uh, can be regenerated and it will be better for the farmers as well. Uh, we are working with businesses to you know, try and find solutions that work both for the farmers as well as businesses. Otherwise, businesses are probably looking at only reducing their own carbon footprint but climate change isn't just about carbon, it is, it is a much bigger conversation. So we're trying to support on all these sides. There is also an issue uh, which was seen last year, which is not specific to climate, but because of COVID and how the fashion sector went into, because that fashion was the last thing when the world went into lockdown. So there was this whole unpredictability of the fashion sector as well. And um, so we are trying to address and support with that as well. And like I said earlier, all these issues are interconnected. So we can't just address one and, and forget the um, other or leave it for later for that matter. Thank you, that's excellent. Yeah, um, it's really interesting to hear and really stark really for people and what they're experiencing right now. Um, Simone, we've talked a lot about um, fashion and race but race also has an integral relationship with the climate and the environment um, and it affects the climate mo social movements that we have can you explain to us what climate colonialism is and tell us more about your work on that um, environmental racism sure so like colonialism and like the environment are like um they they can't be considered like mutually exclusive like they actually can't exist without each other um like colonialism relied on like the land on of course the people on the land to kind of function um therefore and that's what it became like the land was owned people were owned in order to like serve the means of production whether that was like sugar or cotton examples um and like um, we can see that like it feeds into the environmental racism that we see today because like land and resources from continents and countries considered the global south today have been exploited, ex extracted from and owned by a set few people, companies and economies, particularly in the global north, which were previous colonial powers to maintain economic, social and social power over these subjects globally. And like we can see like the effects of like climate change by looking at the land like we can see that there, we still have polluted rivers we have like vast mines where like land has been completely dug out we can see like how territories have been like extracted from and like in like colonial times so, like between like the 17th to the like 20th century uh, mangroves grasslands rainforests wetlands were all cleared to make ways for quarries plantations ranches roads and railways and those things are still there like you can go to areas of the caribbean for example that have like these colonial railways and railroads that um, used to transport like the goods to the port to be exported back to the UK. You also have some examples of like railroads in India, for example, where Britain was also very prevalent with their colonialism. Um, and then like we see this happening with like the sugarcane industry in colonial times, for example. Um, it mostly grew in like Latin America and the Caribbean and like this caused like the destruction of forest, water, it caused pollution and the loss and fertility of like soil soils um and like 
th those lands have like permanently changed like even though that happened around like 300 years ago which isn't actually that long of a time um the vegeta vegetation in areas in the Caribbean are not the same as like vegetation on like the top of mountains where they weren't necessarily used for sugar production so we can see that like they no longer yield the same kind of size of crop they no longer some places don't actually grow things anymore because the soil was like overused that much and like it this was all kind of justified um ecological destruction and colonialism um and like racism enshrined in that was justified why because it was bringing the political, social, economic and cultural advancement of colonial powers like Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, Belgium, Germany, like the list goes on. Um, and like Britain actually like bears the largest responsibility per capita for historic greenhouse emissions from burning coal in the Industrial Revolution. And like connecting that to colonialism, the only reason why they were able to have the Industrial Revolution first and on the scale that they had it is from the money they made from exploiting black people in slavery. Um, so you can see how like Britain's wealth and Britain's like standing in the world was directly built off of the black backs of black people, black and brown people across the globe and like the extraction from their land and resources. And like a point to kind of remember here, and it also applies to today, is that a lot of this was justified, not just by like who says who's like inferior or not, but it was actually enshrined in like, institutions and policies and laws and science and research and academia and these are all used to like categorize different people and lands and resources in order to subordinate them under Britain and like under white supremacy um which justified this exploitation and extraction so like for a lot of people they didn't see it as a wrong thing um it wasn't actually illegal it wasn't a wrong thing because it was like advancing the UK and other colonial powers so like when we think about like colonialism and racism we need to kind of see who legitimizes these practices um both for like social and climate injustice and like often we can see that like it's governments it's universities it's the military it's the police it's that are heavily tied to like the legitimization of like social and environmental injustice and like i guess that like leading on to like environmental racism um this all feeds into like what we see today um where black indigenous people of color particularly in the global south are facing the harshest consequences of like climate change whether that's like food insecurity or like flooding or drought um or even political tensions over resources so for example like the sudan war civil war was actually one of the main contributors to like the war was water insecurity um and that was caused by like extensive droughts um and like these are all seen in these areas first and like the same patterns of like extraction and profit making that were done in like the transatlantic slave trade for example mimic what we see today where like the uk and previous colonial powers are still being able to extract raw raw materials from these countries whether it's like asia the Caribbean, Africa, and are able to refine these and sell them on for higher prices and profits to the rest of the world. And that looks like oil extraction, mass agriculture production, fashion production, and so much more. And like going into sort of like what my work is and what I do, um, it's basically around like educating and supporting with campaign actions. Like I think it's important that we understand that this where we are today with like the fashion industry, climate injustice, social injustice is not just something that's happened in the last 50 years. Like it's deliberate and it's been like over 500 years of like exploitation and dominance and violence against black indigenous people of color. And like it, if we don't tackle it, it will play into our, our movements in one, the solutions that we propose and also the narratives that we build around climate justice um and unfortunately they will be racist because we don't know how to deal with the history that we we've lived on um and like I work with young people to kind of explain these histories and like talk about like how climate colonialism links to environmental racism today and how it affects like different groups across the globe um and for like for me it's all about like holding our institutions to account it's like how do we like for us in the UK, for example, the, as like Sibindu said, like we're not, we're facing the effects of climate change, but they're not as devastating as others. And it's like a lot of companies that are causing a lot of the damage are actually British companies. Like for example, Barclays Bank is funding loads of the climate projects climate extraction projects across the globe or like pretty little thing is I think it's British I'm not actually sure um so don't quote me but like you can see how like this the center of the violence is never in the UK so we never really get to see it 
Um, so whether that's like divesting from like getting your local council to divest from fossil fuels in our pension funds, or it's getting your university to, to take its investments out of the arms industry and fossil fuel industry, or whether that's like getting young people to tackle the food insecurity that we have here in the UK. Um, those are all things that we try to do to like incorporate um, race and like climate justice into our narratives. Um, and yeah, most of it is like direct action campaigns or like awareness campaigns or like smearing campaigns because like a lot of these companies as well have like made so much profit that they put a lot of money into like greenwashing which is essentially like making it look like they're really green and they're doing great things for the environment when in reality they are profiting off climate breakdown so it's important to also highlight the ways that companies shield themselves with marketing to make themselves look better when in fact like they're exploiting loads of people across the globe and actually like continue to kind of profit off of social and environmental injustice really excellent <laughs> yeah i think that, that just this fits so well with everything that we do and what we do in fair trade and, and talking about sugar and a lot of the the products that you'll see that are fair trade they've been they've been picked because they're products that have these issues that are entrenched and are really difficult to get out of and so you'll see that you have cotton you have cocoa you have tea you have sugar you have bananas all of these things that that people associate with fair trade are things which are historically are colonial products and the reasons that they're in those places and what they're doing is is because of that history and I think it's right it's it's good to actually talk about that and have a, a reckoning of that Ophelia Um, yeah, I just had a, a, a quote that would just fit perfectly right here. So um, thank you, Simone. That was really um, informative. Um, so this is from Love Close Last by Ursula um, de Castro, who's the founder of um, Fashion Revolution. And it's about um, cotton and colonialism. So it goes, I'm going to try and read. Clearly, I'm not very good at reading out loud. Um, <laughs> colonialism is not a thing of the past. It is a modern economic reality. When we trace cotton, labour and silk roots, they all map identically with colonial roots established a few hundred years ago. By empowering the, the existing system of exploitation of labour and resources, we are, um, com we are complying to the colonial model of extraction and destruction that ends up benefiting only a few of the top of that pyramid, that pyramid scheme. So yeah, she just thought I'd add that because it just fitted in um, well with what Simone was talking about, um, which is it's very true that, you know, colonialism is, um, it, it lives with us, it's in our structures, it's in everyday life, um, and it maybe we shouldn't be talking about it, it as if it was something that happened. Thank you, that's brilliant. Um, that's a really good quote and um, I'm sure lots of people would be of interested in the book there that you've uh, that you've mentioned there's lots going on at the moment um, with books and I know that our people occupying our chat can put the details up there so that's really useful um, thank you Ophelia I know that you had some slides you wanted to share with us as well um, oh I'm on mute yeah let me <laughs> let me get that up for you guys um, share screen. So I just wanted to go through a quick um, slide here. I'm going to try and keep it quite brief. Um, I'm much more of a visual person, so I thought I could explain a little bit better um, with some pictures. Um, so how do I start? I start from here, yeah. Okay, here we go. So um, as I mentioned, I'm a textile designer um, and I specialize in hand embroidery. Um, and I come from a family of, uh, of creatives that have all had really um, traditional um, skills and artists, um, artistry, I should say. Um, so my grandfather was a carpenter and my dad is a stonemason, so he can carve stone. Um, and I think this uh, really inspired me to take on something that uh, requires a lot of patience. Um, so in my work today, I... Um, I really um, embody that that slowness of, of fashion, um, of, of sustainable fashion. Um, I started out as a 
calling myself a sustainable brand that I, I felt like I probably wasn't um, using my bo- my voice um, for activism in the best way. Um, so then I um, decided that I would stop selling things and I never wanted to be a seller of things. And I think um, going down that route of being a sustainable brand, it, it probably took away from the joy that I had from sewing and doing embroidery. Um, so now I, I create things, but I'm very selfish with my creations because I don't really sell anything and I just like to look at them. They just, you know, live, live in my wardrobe um, that I look at every day. And I wear, I wear most of these things that you can see in these pictures. Um, and then next. So through my practice, I kind of focus on skill sharing as a powerful tool to explore the complexities of climate change um, and try to create a space that's inclusive and accessible to all community members. Um, The environmental space can often be very um, white and it can um, center white voices. So through my work, I tried to teach people about climate in a way that breaks down the complicated language and um, allows people to be kind of climate, the climate leaders of the communities and that they can, you know, create change with very small actions like sewing. It can be a bit of a, like an entry level into environmentalism. And I also talk about um, how climate change is disproportionate, disproportionately um, affecting black and brown people over the globe. Um, let's go to next. So I wanted to include a little, a few um, statistics. Um, so in the UK, it is estimated around 350,000 tons of wearable clothing are sent to landfill every year. Um, in the last 15 years, global um, clothing production has doubled globally. Globally, well. <laughs> Um, the fashion industry produces over 50, um, 100 billion garments per year. Um, so as I said, touched on earlier, and I talked about past fashion, um, it, it today, um, and in, especially in the last 15 years, um, we have seen the rise of social media and of the internet that has really um, propelled fas- fast fashion and fashion into um, kind of like this monster machine that isn't going to um, stop. Um, so the, the term fast fashion, actually, interestingly, it was coined in the 1980s by um, the New York Times, and they used it to um, describe the arrival of Zara to the US. And at this time, uh, Zara Zara's turnaround was about 15 days. So from uh, design to shop floor, it took them about 15 days. Um, now I think it might be less uh, less than a week, which is crazy. Um, and yeah, so fa- fast fashion is, is uh, similar to like fast food in a way. I think that's where it came from. Um, I know we need, we kind of um, touched on like fibers and fabrics, so I wanted to talk a little bit about breakdown. Um, so unless considered at the design stage, recycling clothing can be very difficult because of all of the um, components. If we think about zips, um, lining, um, like pockets and everything, they're not easily disassembled, which means they often go straight to landfill. Um, and then uh, where they can, you know, be there for like hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, it is really good to kind of uh, brush up on your knowledge about fibers and fabrics. Um, you might have uh, started doing it in like a, a textile class at school. I don't know if everyone had textile classes because some people don't apparently, which is I don't understand. <laughs> um, but um, fibers are normally bra- uh, fibers and fabrics are normally broken up into three sections. So you'd have like natural fibers, you'd have synthetic fibers, and then you'd have and blended fibers um, and fabrics, which are created from a mixture of um, synthetic and natural uh, materials. Um, so natural um, fibers and fabrics are those that come from plants or animals, um, and they usually uh, are a lot quicker to break down. 
Um, unfortunately, uh, the fashion that is produced today, I think it's uh, nearly 70% of the fashion produced today uses um, polyester and synthetic fibers. Um, so fashion is like still hugely reliant on sheep and oil-based synthetics. And these are used to create um, polyester, acrylic, um, and polyamide. Um, and then these normally take hundreds and hundreds of years uh, to decompose. And then, what is next? I thought I was a, such a genius when I created this little um, graphic. <laughs> How do I go next? So when we, um, when we don't know what to do with our clothes, a lot of people will um, normally give their clothes to charity, you know, under the guise of, of goodwill. And we think it might help people in some way. And we think, you know, that's where, um, that's a way to get rid of our problems maybe because we don't have to worry about it going to waste. Um, but unfortunately, um, only uh, 10 to 20% of uh, clothing um, donated to charities actually get sold. Um, so all the unused, unsellable, um, low value clothing often get turned into clothing, um, clothing bales um, and exported to locations in the global south. Um, here's one example um, in um, Accra, Ghana. This is Cantamanto Market and this receives um, 50 million garments per week. Um, so a great page to check out is the Auras Present. Um, you can uh, type that in. Um, I'm going to reference their page at the end as well. How are we doing for time? I feel like I'm just trying to quickly go through them. Yeah, you're doing okay. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so um, as I mentioned, like we live in a very fast paced society and we normally buy without thinking. So um, some questions that you might want to ask yourself before you buy something are, am I buying it because of a trend or do I really like it? Um, do the values align uh, with, do my values align with the brands? Do I have clothes to match? Um, do I already have something similar? Um, can I find out about uh, the where the item is made or how the item is made? Um, is the brand scale sustainable? Um, so it's always good to kind of, you know, have a sleep on it before you make a purchase. Um, and I know, you know, you do get that dopamine hit when you, you buy something and it's really quick and it'll, it can be delivered to your house the next day if you use Amazon Prime. So before you buy something, just try and give it a day, just sleep on it and ask yourself a few questions. And then here's some of my book recommendations. So I already mentioned um, Love Clothes Last, that is where that quote is from and it it's, um, it's got a lot about fibers and fabrics in there so it really breaks them down and um, it, like gives you lots of tips for upcycling um, really good book and then there's um, Consume by Aja Barbara which is about the collective need for uh, change colonialism climate change and consumerism um, which is really interesting because um you know, as I've already talked about dopamines and stuff, um, fashion psychology and marketing is a whole other um, kind of uh, story that we could talk about because they can use some really shady tactics um, to get us to buy. Um, and then lastly, um, I've just finished this. So this is Climate Change is Racist by Jeremy Williams. And it really... Um, it's, a, it's a, a book that's easy to read, like he talks to you like you're having a chat. Um, and like a lot of books that are about climate change, they're very complicated or heavy to read. But this is only 200 pages, so it's a really good book. Um, if you want to learn more about kind of what we've talked about and the link between um, racism and climate change. Um, so, yeah, that's a great one to look at. And then I've got some accounts to follow. You might have already come across these. Um, so the Slow Factory is a big one. Um, the Ore is present, which is the Ore Foundation, um, which is what I talked about previously. And then there's a fashion psychology page that is also really interesting. Um, if you want to learn more about um, kind of the um, 
the why we are pushed to buy things. Um, and I think that's it. I just wanted to go through those quickly. <laughs> Thank you, Fia. I think that just shows like the range of topics there is to talk about. You know, waste isn't something we'd really spoken about yet. And yet the circular economy, everything, um, everything exists and continues. I used to volunteer in a, in a charity shop and the amount of people who who put broken things in there. And then you actually if you're a shop, you have to pay for your waste to be taken away. So it even costs you to receive <laughs> things that you can't sell. Um, so, yeah, that's excellent. Um, so uh, at Fair Trade Wales, we always recommend that people buy secondhand. But if you are buying something new, that you make sure you're buying something that's fair trade. Um, and Sabinda, you talked um, a lot about working in the fashion industry. Obviously, now you're you're at the Fair Trade and doing that. And I think Ophelia brought up these issues of fast fashion and how fast fashion seems to have almost increased in pace over over the years. Sort of what. Um, I'd be interested to hear sort of from your experience, do you do you see that in the fashion industry? And do you think that that slowing down fashion or, or increasing prices can sort of um, can help prevent doing these things? So it is it is a strange time in the sector. There is a lot of pressure on sustainability. There is a lot of greenwashing, too. So it is. Uh, it is not easy to decipher, uh, you know, where when the brands are doing the right thing for for the sake of doing the right thing, or because it is a bit of greenwashing. And you know, there are many examples where I think Simone referred to some really good examples where you might be causing way too much harm, but you might do a little bit of uh, a bit of glossing. Uh, but what is interesting, I think what has changed is the pressure that is on businesses in the last decade or so. Um, so it isn't just a moral obligation anymore. It is also becoming more and more um, legally required as well. So just last week, a directive in, uh, in the EU has come about regarding human rights due diligence in the fashion supply chains which will be now mandatory. So it is business's responsibility um, if there is, you know, to respect human rights in their, in their supply chain, however distant it is. It isn't about proximity. It isn't about this, I work with this supplier and I do not know where my cotton comes from. If it is in your supply chain, it is the responsibility of, of business. And businesses could be a force of good. So again, it is one of those things which is very difficult. So you have to work with them uh, to try and, um, you know, get to the other side. Similarly, I think we touched on slow fashion as well. Uh, so there has been a lot of talk about circularity. Uh, unfortunately, uh, sometimes it is also considered as a silver bullet, so we should not fall into the trap that circularity will solve all our problems because circularity also needs to be done right. So when we're talking about um, justice, we are not just talking about trade justice or climate justice, we also have to ensure that the social side in circularity is also, uh, is also taken care of. So I would, uh, so maybe I'm not addressing your question directly, but, uh, so I would not necessarily say that we are seeing an increase in fast fashion. I would actually, I'm seeing signs that fast fashion brands are also trying to move into slow fashion, they're all trying out secondhand clothes. They're trying um, not just circularity in the business model, but also of raw materials. They're also trying out secondhand clothing. So this throws up new challenges that if a fast fashion business is going to run a secondhand store, what's going to happen to the civil society who runs secondhand? So this brings in new problems, uh, but I would still say it is a step in the right direction but probably needs more thinking. And I think, I think Ophelia, one of you guys mentioned uh, the clothes that go to Africa. It is not just about the secondhand clothing ending up there. It is about what is its impact on the potential or the previously existing fashion supply chains, which has almost died in, in a lot of African countries. So not, unfortunately, none of these conversations are simple or with you know, a one line answer. It is a rabbit hole, you pick up one thing, it leads to another problem. That's why these are systemic issues and 
need to be approached really, really carefully. So probably I didn't answer your question, but I think I've touched on a few points where I see things are things are moving. Mm, that's really interesting to to hear about the the legal requirements and and how that's pushing the industry forward. And also, it, it's um nice as a campaigner to feel that even if it is lip service, companies feel like they have to address the climate, they have to address social impact in in some way, yeah. and that in and of itself is a big step forward when you think that companies didn't used to do that. Um, uh, one Sorry, and there's, there's this pressure on greenwashing as well. So uh, in other countries, as well as in the UK, businesses will be held accountable for, you know, using marketing material, which is not uh, backed by evidence, green, natural, what does that all even mean? So there is more and more pressure, especially on fashion brands as well. Brilliant. That's really good to hear. Um, I know that one of the um, magazines that I get is called Ethical Consumer, um, and it rates companies on a range of different issues. Um, and it very much looks into actually what what they are doing rather than just what they are claiming. Yeah. Um, and they look at clothing, they look at a whole range of different issues. And the thing that I found personally beneficial about that magazine the most is that I know companies I want to avoid, but that I still need to buy clothes <laughs> or, you know, and I, I can get certain things in the charity shops. There are other things I need to get new. So what it really does help you do in a whole range of issues is find those small companies or those, those alternatives out there that are doing something good and are promoting uh, these sort of ethical things. And again, as you said, each of these things don't necessarily one company might be doing great in one area and haven't thought about another yet because they are all interconnected, but it's good to support. Um, Ophelia. You're on mute. Oops, here I am. Um, just adding on to what you were saying about needing to buy clothes, I think it's important not to have too much pressure on ourselves because Otherwise, we're, we're all going to be skint because we've all bought like sustainable clothes. Um, I think um, we just have to um, teach um, about uh, more, buying things in moderation and... Um, you know, it is okay to, to buy new pants. Like, <laughs> you're not going to get a secondhand pants. That's not going to be a thing. Um, so, yeah, just like I, I would really advise people to to take it easy and not to stress them themselves out because otherwise we're not we're not going to, you know, live life um, with enjoyment. We'll just constantly be um, worrying about our impact on the planet. And I think over the last few months, um, I've really, um, like, leaned into just, like, sounds cheesy but like more self-compassion and just being like it's okay if I'm going to use like something that's single-use plastic it's not the end of the world I think um we just need to um yeah think about things more um deeply thank you that's brilliant um Simone I'd be really interested to hear um how if at all, you think the fashion industry could be more inclusive of the racialized communities and indigenous cultures, or if it's they are just inherently racist through this kind of exploitative nature? That's a big question. <laughs> it, it really is. Um, wow. Um, I, sorry, was the question, can it, can it be more fair? Yeah, and if so, how do you think it might be? I think under like fast fashion, like the mode of fast fashion, no. Um, and I think only because like the like fast fashion that's inherent, like racism and like extraction and exploitation is inherent to fast fashion in order to like produce these clothes and these trends as quickly as possible for the least profit. Um, and that kind of like business model kind of requires like, it requires exploitation, it requires like um, labor from people um, that can be paid less in particularly the global South, black, brown, indigenous people. Um, and like, I think, yeah, in that case, like in order for it to be sustainable, it would actually, you'd actually have to get rid of fast fashion. Like, I don't think fast fashion can be reformed and like, it would, yeah, really ask us to 
tackle our global consumption and like um yeah how like our consumption is like underpinned by like capitalism um I think like in fashion though because there's like slower fashion and there's like yeah like kind of batch you know you make like a capsule collection and like I think that also counts under slow fashion I don't know um I think on in that side like there's potential like I think like if you're able to for example allow um black and indigenous people to like um own shares in that company potentially make it sort of like a co-op kind of thing or like at least start with like paying them like adequate wages like I think a lot of people outsource their labor simply because like it makes it cheaper and like increases the company's profits rather than actually paying um people for their labor and allowing them to live like lives that aren't just on the threshold or on like the breadline rather like live like life affirming lives um so it would have to start with like paying them a wage that like actually is like sustainable for living rather than surviving I think like it should be something where they're allowed like their workers rights are like respected and like worker safety is like a priority like we see a lot of like these kind of fashion factories often like the safety is like through the window like they collapse on people they have like they're cramped they have like awful fumes that like people breathe in day in day out um they're not covered by insurance by this company so people are developing like awful like cardiovascular or like breathing issues and like that's sort of it for them um I think like yeah they need to be given the right equipment such as like you know maybe some masks for the fumes like adequate uniforms for like the chemicals or whatever I think like giving them the rights to uni unionize not that they should be given rights they should have the right to unionize um so the right to unionize I think like yeah those are some ways that it can become inclusive um but yeah it, it is difficult because I think um yeah fashion the way that it's modeled and because of the way that we like to consume things um it, it is um it is hard to move slowly and I think for a lot of these brands it's like what are you like willing to like give up for a lot of these brands if they want to incorporate all of these things because of how like fashion is like geared to being like extractive and exploitative them being slower and like being inclusive of like black and indigenous people and brown people would require them to give up some of their profits and it's like are you willing to do that and a lot of them aren't um because like being willing to spend on these people and these companies would and and like yeah making your company better would require you to lose a lot of that um so yeah in like fashion maybe slow fashion possible fast fashion I think absolutely not thank you that's really a lot of good points there um we've had lots of interesting chat going on we won't be actually getting around to any of the questions because we are almost um at an end um so I want to thank everyone I have a final question to ask everyone if you could just do a quick roundup and that is um Can you, I'm gonna gonna end on a happy note actually. Can you each tell us one hope you have for the future on this topic we've talked about today? Um, and so I'm gonna start with Sabindu. Well, we have to hope that things will get better. Otherwise, uh, you know, we can't get up and go to work uh, every day. So it is slow, uh, but I am seeing seeing progress. Uh, so I, I'll also try and end it, end it on the positive note uh, rather than focusing on, but it's too slow. Yeah, there is some progress. <laughs> Thank you. Ophelia. Um, that's a good question, let me think. Um, so I think, well, I would hope that we choose um, action that is led by optimism for the future instead of um, fear for the future. Um, you know, like we need to carry on and keep up our resilience, I think. Thanks, Sophia. That's brilliant. And Simone? Uh, genuinely, just for people to, like, live easy, like, for people to be able to, like, create and sleep and rest efficiently and learn in, like, safe and healthy environments. Um, it's, it seems quite basic, but a lot of people don't get that. And often we're working to our wits end. So the ability to, like, rest and just live <laughs> is my hope that sounds brilliant yes I think that 
what we've talked about today, you know, it's very easy for us as activists and, and consumers, you know, we, we have those really interesting questions from a feeler about what to think about when we go shopping, but actually it's about also making change in the fashion industry um, and whether that's possible at all that Simone touched on. And then Sabindu to hear from you to talk about actually now there are legal requirements coming in, no matter what the, the brands might want to do, what they are legally required to do uh, are to start thinking about these issues more. So that's really hopeful. Um, I'm going to say Diochen Varyaun which means thank you very much uh, to everyone today. Now, if you want to get in touch with any, um, with Sabindu, Ophelia or Simone, I think their various socials or contact details are going to be going into the chat. Um, uh, Fair Trade Fortnight 2022 is still going. If you want to look at any more events, you can go onto the UK festival site at Choose the World You Want. If you type that in, uh, the Fair Trade Foundation is hosting all of the events. A couple of things specifically about fashion and climate justice that you might be interested in. Uh, on the 4th of March at 11 a.m., um, Cool Schools are organising something called Threads, the Sustainable Cotton Journey, and they'll be talking uh, with someone who manages a sustainable clothing factory in India and with someone who um, works as a cotton producer and cotton farmer. So that's something really interesting to see. And also on Friday, we will be publishing on YouTube a conversation about climate change and fashion um, that I had a few weeks ago with um, the Ranga, who is the um, CEO of the factory in India and also the Minister for Social Justice in the Welsh Government. Um, who touched on, who both touched on quite a lot of the issues we've seen today about regeneration in the soil, about the fact that soil has been depleted, about the legacies we have in the UK of the amount of uh, carbon we've put into the atmosphere. So that could be interesting. You can watch out for that on our YouTube. Um, we also, if you're interested in other Wales events on the 6th of March at 11am, there's something called Coffee Culture, which is going on. And um, this event has been funded. We are funded uh, by the Welsh Government through Hub Cymru Africa. And for that, we have to collect feedback. So if you have a minute or two to collect some feedback, that is wonderful. I want to say thank you very much to everyone again. And um, yes, that is that is our end. So we will remain here a couple of minutes um, and then we will be off. Thank you so much. And I would have loved to have talked for much longer with all of you and hopefully we can uh, work together again in the future. Thank you, Sabindu, Ophelia and Simone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.